The emotional content in human nature presents us with one of life's greatest challenges. We know that without emotion, the world as we hope it will be could never come into existence. Emotion is absolutely necessary to break the patterns of rationality which lock us too often in a dead factualism. We all need facts, we all need realities, but we also require what nature has always provided, namely a continuous combination of beauty and reality. Beauty has come to most people to represent the most powerful nourishing force in the area of our emotions. Man's emotions mature under some type of impact of sublimity, sublime things, noble things, truly great things, raise us to new inward appreciations. They also provide a kind of psychic proof that good is a marvelous and healing force in life. Emotional patterns come into manifestation in the growth of the individual with extraordinary intensity between about the 13th and the 20th year of physical life. During this period, the individual is passing through what we like to term adolescence, a period of emotional confusion. This confusion is really the manifestation of the birth of man's capacities to feel. There is really nothing about adolescence that should be regarded as evil. It is simply man suddenly coming to experience through feeling his relationship with life. One of our troubles seems to be that we have never yet found an adequate pattern for educating emotions. The mind we can educate. We seem to have a certain skill in bestowing upon it formalized concepts and precepts. But emotions are things that are so elusive, so intense, and so dynamic, and in a measure so strangely personal and individual, that we have never yet been able to completely standardize a system of education applicable to them. What we seem to require at this stage of the growth of the individual is a very heavy dependency upon example and upon providing the emotions with constructive uh, experiences and opportunities. We naturally desire to experience emotionally, all things as good or beautiful. Left entirely to its own devices, emotion dramatizes. Emotion provides strange auras of bright light around commonplace objects and persons and situations. Emotions uh, seem to release a tremendous intensity of what we call affection. But all in all, it is only a phase of man's own life waking up inside of him and looking out through the sensory instruments into some kind of a world. This world is going to be experienced emotionally only in terms of beauty or deformity, of pain or pleasure, happiness or misery. 
everything is going to be in terms of impacts which the individual attempts to face by the impulses emerging from his own nature. If we could do a little more to provide a solid emotional experience for the young, they would be better people when they get older. Emotions are not in any sense of the word things that have to be destroyed or blocked or censored. They have to be directed and unfolded in harmony with some basic concept of reality. In the older generations, religion played a very large part in the integration of man's emotional life. He turned a great deal of his emotional energy to worship. And at a time when perhaps he required a little special censorship during adolescence, the religious pattern to which he belonged provided him with a rather clear code of emotional controls. With the loss of religious leadership, man's emotional life has lost nearly all of its directives. And we have come finally to take the attitude that we must simply express, reveal, and follow the pressures or tendencies without directive or without repression of any kind. This would not be so serious either if the world was not constantly confronting the individual with negative emotional stimuli. The emotions of man, if he lived in a happy world, would be reasonably happy. But when he lives in a world of great discord, his own emotions dramatize these, this discordant condition. There is also one other important factor that is generally overlooked. When we dramatize the emotional patterns around us, we are actually trying to feel something that is not from within ourselves and therefore not actually understood by us. We can dramatize the emotional plights of other people, but we are not experiencing the emotions of those people. We are experiencing only our own emotions. Consequently, we often come to very erroneous emotional reactions, totally inconsistent with the actual facts involved. We dramatize too much, and we make the mistake of assuming that every other person's emotional reaction is the same as ours. This is not the case. Some persons coming along through the years have a comparatively uh, slight emotional problem. Uh, we sometimes think that they are better controlled. Usually, however, it is not control that is making the difference. It's the fact that the emotions are not as intense. Those who have less intense emotions or those who through environment have early integrated their emotional patterns have a much easier time uh, adjusting with life and life circumstances. Actually, it is the same with an emotion as it is with a habit. Uh, the less directive there is, the less control and insight there are, the greater the problem will be. And the problem today is very serious. Most persons, however, reach the adolescent period and drift on into what they call physical, mental maturity without ever actually solving an emotional problem. They have to depend upon some kind of natural miracle. They have to believe and hope that in the various psychobiological processes of man's own growth, his emotional pressures will subside 
as his mental interests develop so that finally he will gain a certain control, not because he has achieved anything himself, but because new interests and new activities have redirected his energies. This is nice, but it is usually an optimistic point of view. It is true in some cases, but in most cases the person simply imposes a more rigid mental code upon a disorganized emotional life. And therefore we have a very bad break in the foundation upon which mature life is built. We have the individual developing his physical body and coming into this world with a reasonably equipped physical organism. During the period in which growth is very largely controlled by nature rather than by human effort, he develops a fairly adequate vital nature. He develops a means of communicating with his own body through his nerve and vital senses. And he also becomes capable of greater communication with the world on the outside. He then approaches his emotional life. But here, a certain amount of internal directive begins to become necessary. Unless parents, families, schools, churches, various institutions or circumstances assist in the development of these emotional control factors, the individual passes along to a mental integration without any solid emotional life behind this integration. Now when the mind takes over and we are supposed to be very reasonable creatures, we begin also to rationalize our own achievement. One of the earliest bestowals of mind is a sense of our own infallibility. We gradually climb the steep side of Fool's Mountain until we reach the summit at about 21. At this point, we really know all there is to know, more than was ever known before in history. We begin to realize how little everyone else knows, which is not quite so helpful. We begin to recognize the need for vast changes in life and more or less dedicate ourselves to the achievement of these changes. Mind gives us certain penetrations, certain faculties of observation and reflection. But behind this mental nature, which incidentally also is not too well established in the average person, continues this nagging of undisciplined emotional intensity. Where emotion does not support mind, and where mind cannot clarify emotion, we begin to develop an intense conflict within the person himself. We, be, we discover that he has not the courage to defend his better thoughts. He does not have the mental integration to support constructive emotional resolution. And finally, the tendency seems to be for mind to support the worst part of emotion and emotion to interfere with the best part of thinking. Out of this combination, we have a very insecure individual. No pattern that he develops for his own moral or ethical growth can stand emotional pressures from within himself. The pattern breaks down because there is no coordination within the person. The mental determinations of the individual toward certain goals and certain purposes are often dramatized unwisely by emotion, which causes many times the mental nature to try to exceed its own capacities under the drive of ambition, which is a typical emotion of this nature, the individual loses his ability to judge his own capacities. 
under the pressure of the emotion to gratify some sensory perception, the individual may compromise his entire life or destroy his entire career. Thus emotion and thought do not work together harmoniously as they should. We do have a fair skill in training the person for his job in life. We can, if reasonable cooperation is achieved, train an individual for a profession or an art or a craft or a trade. We can give him the skills necessary uh, to become a self-sustaining citizen. We can also provide him with the abilities to improve himself economically and to advance in a career. But we cannot provide this individual with emotional stability. We cannot prevent him from ruining his own life simply because he does not know how to use the emotional factors within himself. So, somewhere along the line, people who think they are pretty wise, but who are constantly making emotional mistakes, begin to recognize the need for emotional education. Psychology, to a measure, tries to do this, but emotions seldom respond constructively to advice of any kind. The mind can be reasoned with, or at least coerced, into some kind of a pattern. Perhaps the mind, using one negative emotion, fear, can be frightened into conformities. But emotions are very difficult to control or direct. They cannot be merely dogmatically instructed. You tell the individual what he should do emotionally, and he will agree with you, and then pathetically announce that he cannot do it. And wherever we find emotions, we find persons browbeaten by them. If emotions are not organized, are not brought into some kind of constructive pattern, they beat the person to whom they belong for his entire lifetime. They whip him. And before he gets through life, he realizes that his emotions have largely destroyed his career or his hope or his inspiration or aspiration toward a better life. Not being able to simply force emotions into line, which we learn from the study of criminal situations, we know that we cannot prevent crime by frustrating emotional intensities. The criminal problem is one always opening itself to the need for education, but except for such crimes as arise from mental sources, you have very great difficulty in re-educating the person whose delinquencies are due to emotional pressure. This is one of the things we find in working with people on almost all levels of psychological and philosophical and religious work. These people are not going to be criminals, at least uh, the majority of them, but they still lack the ability to make their emotional lives valuable to them. They are impoverished by their own feelings. Now, this impoverishment can take several different forms. One type of emotional impoverishment is this sense of futility which comes from no emotional integration. The individual is incapable of feeling good. Uh, good, perhaps in a sense in this way, usage, implies an emotional state that is satisfactory to the life of the person. He is basically 
uh, constructive in his feeling. He is more or less content. He is happy in a moderate way. If the emotions never permit the individual to feel satisfied with himself or with life, if they never comfort him in his emergencies, then they are useless. They are indeed a poor relation or a bad friend. Another type of emotional difficulty with most people is pressure, where the emotions are forcing the person to do things which normally and naturally he would not choose to do. Mentally, he can understand this, and he can mentally set up barriers to curb emotion. But in most cases, these barriers break down. A good example of this, of course, is fighting a habit, where the habit may have an emotional ground of some nature, as in the case of alcoholism. Here the mind is perfectly aware of the danger. Here the rational part of the individual realizes the hazards and tragedies that lie ahead, but the emotional nature continues to demand satisfaction. The person is unable to cope with it. Sometimes he does overcome the problem, but it becomes a great and terrible thing which should not exist at all. The emotion should never be that far out of control. You talk to people about this, and they will tell you that the reason why their emotions are sick is because they as persons have been desperately hurt along the way of life. They have been disillusioned, they have been injured, until their emotions have become very largely instruments of self-pity. They have taken as much fear, worry, responsibility, and anguish as they are capable of sustaining. The emotions are hurt, sick, tired, unhappy. And with this emotional pattern behind the complex of life, it is certain that the emotions are going to infect the mind. The emotional attitudes are going to force the mind to create rational justifications for the miseries of the emotional life. The individual who has made a poor go of marriage emotionally experiences a tragedy. But it is very rare that this experience brings its full benefit to the person because he demands emotionally that the mind prove that he was right in this situation and the other person was wrong. So all he gets out of it is a strange kind of melancholy satisfaction that he suffered unjustly. Now, the moment the emotions take on unjust suffering, they get so sorry for themselves that no one can live with them. The mind of the person is bound into a pattern of trying to prove how much the emotions have suffered. And whenever the mind tries to think constructively and says perhaps there's a reasonable explanation for these things, the emotions come in like a fanatic and try to tear down the mental position. So we have this fight going on constantly in ourselves. How then can we hope to do something to mature the emotional life of the person. I think Plato gave us a pretty good clue to this situation, and many of the older Greek thinkers uh, have uh, left pretty solid instruction or suggestion. The Greeks were a people not much given to frustration. Uh, they did not follow the belief that the only thing you can do with an emotion is lock it. In the last 19 centuries, Western religion and philosophy have very largely emphasized the importance of frustrating emotion. That if you can't get along with it, lock it up somewhere. Do not allow it to function at all. 
demand only that this uh, part of life be regarded as sinful, and therefore t we should turn from it or give it no opportunity to express, except perhaps in some such negative emotion as penance or self-censure. The Greeks, however, did not share this thinking. They recognized what modern man is beginning to realize, namely that emotions are useful, and the problem is to use them rather than merely uh, to punish them. The Greeks decided from the very beginning that emotions must be fed exactly as mind is fed. If you do not provide information to the mind, it cannot function. If you provide it with false information, it will arrive at false conclusions. Therefore, throughout life, we are constantly confronting the mind with opportunities to learn. There is not a day go by in which the newspapers and magazines and journals do not come out offering various educational opportunities, opportunities to train for various talents, opportunities to improve uh, neglected fields of knowledge, how the person who left school too soon can earn his diploma and go on. Then books of all natures and uh, types come to us, books telling us the wonders of the sea or of mountains and exploration of far countries, of interesting beliefs, of history and art and literature. We are surrounded constantly with opportunities to expand the mental horizon of life. We sort of assume that this is where the emphasis should be, and that some way security results from increasing knowledge. You cannot disprove this, but there is one fact that remains, namely with all this flood of available knowledge and millions of people making use of it, the emotional problems of life are not solved. The individual with a fine library is just as miserable as the individual who never read a book. He may, the person who has read may know more, but sometimes increasing knowledge is only further opportunity for suffering. And the intelligent person has many pains that the ignorant will never suffer from. If we must feed emotion, how are we going about it? How are we going to try to give the individual greater maturity in his emotional life? The ancients, particularly the Greeks, pointed out that there is an area of knowledge devoted to this, and it is called the arts. The arts represent much more than merely uh, a, va a wide area of knickknacks. Uh, the arts represent both the heritage of man in aesthetics and the means or methods for training the aesthetic instincts of the person. There is no way in which we can simply read ourselves into security aesthetically, but we do know that various types of aesthetic expression and the development and maturing of the art concepts and consciousness in us this pattern was set in the beginning to provide for this important area. For some reason, we have made art a kind of luxury, very seldom getting around to it. We have also penalized it economically, not permitting it to even compete with sciences for, prop, for popular uh, applause or recognition. Arts, therefore, have become uh, almost disgraceful, or at least highly neglected. The one exception in the American way of life being music. Music is still a very great power and is increasing as a power. But other than music, 
uh, which is largely experienced only from the standpoint of appreciation. Uh, we are deficient in art. Years ago, the Greeks also recognized that all arts have to be uh, governed and directed with the same accuracy that distinguishes the sciences. Arts cannot simply be allowed to accumulate or to emotionalize themselves. And here is where music got into a little difficulty. No one really appreciated the, the tremendous science of musical emotion. Pythagoras perhaps recognized a large part of this mystery, but it has not descended to us in any form that we can use. We do know that the Greeks recognized, however, that music cannot be accepted simply because it is sound. It must be sound with meaning, with discipline. The great composer, like the great painter, must have the internal experience of great beauty. He must have a sublimity in himself. He must also have the genius to communicate high constructive value to sound patterns. The artists of the world have a heavy responsibility, for they are largely the ones entrusted with the maturing of man's emotional life. The artists themselves have, for the most part, fallen apart. Modern art has completely rejected its heritage in the same way that modern philosophy has rejected its idealism and is now a very brittle pragmatism with very little to offer anyone. Nearly every phase of knowledge communication has been profaned or has been entrusted to those unskilled and unable to advance any essential meaning. This does not mean that no great art or great music is available, but it does mean that the search for it has now become a personal problem. The individual looking for the maturity of his own psychic life must really work at this problem. He must determine through great thought and great carefulness what constitutes acceptable value for himself. Now there's one thing that we learned that was a very, very famous Greek a number of years ago in modern times who became probably the world's greatest collector of Chinese bronze. The great works of art in bronze were collected by this man. He went all over the world. He spent a huge fortune collecting Chinese bronze. At the climax of his career, he published a tremendous work on the subject with hundreds of reproductions in full color of these bronzes of the 5th century B.C. down to about the 5th or 6th century A.D. In this work, the man revealed two things. A tremendous skill, the result of probably 40 years of intense specialization. He knew, he studied, he examined. He discussed with experts everywhere. He worked with the Chinese connoisseurs to discover what was the greatest value that could be found in bronze the various patines, uh, the wonderful designs, the skillful structure of these objects. He wanted to become a master of the knowledge of the field so that he could go through 
a great collection of bronze and pick out those three or four examples which were the work of the greatest masters of the subject who had ever lived. This man's collection is still regarded as perhaps the highest achievement in its field. And a person today who probably will never actually collect bronze has available to him in the works of this collection the highest standard of knowledge that man possesses. Now the average person looking at a few volumes of this extraordinary collection will probably at first have no way of knowing why this work is good. He will not be able to experience what the specialist experienced after a lifetime of study. But the collector today can say to himself very simply, this work, the, this marvelous collection is a landmark. It will be a long time before anyone will be able to improve upon it as a statement of what is the supreme emotional beauty of Chinese bronze. Therefore, as long as one set of this book remains, we will know what is the greatest in its field. And we will have a way of gradually appraising value. It is something that we can grow up to. We are not left with no way of ever knowing what is good. The same things have been done in music, in painting, and in every field of human endeavor. There is the testimony of the ages as to what is great, what will survive, what is imperishable, what is essentially true and best. And this available knowledge provides the average person with some rule, some way of recognizing excellence. The importance of being able to recognize excellence is that in this way we protect ourselves against emotionalizing that which is not good. If we surround ourselves with meaningless things, then we contribute nothing to the maturing of our own emotions. If, however, we follow as carefully as possible a trained program of surrounding ourselves with that which is best, whether we appreciate it or not at the beginning is not the final criterion. It is whether we can grow up to it. For emotion must have growth. It must challenge us. And the perfection of the great emotional pattern of life is just as intricate as the discovery of the formula of nuclear fission. There is just as great a science in beauty as there is in any branch of skill. And music, art, and the creative expressions of man are just as exacting, just as demanding of the truth seeker as any scientific formula of physics or astronomy or biology. The thing we are trying to do in some way is to feed integration and integrity into emotion. To do this, we must gradually devote emotion to some productive area. Now we can say that uh, this is all a sort of unimportant matter, that perhaps we should all be gathered in prayer on this subject, uh, trying to find some spiritual guide to trying to live a better life. People have done this. And where prayer was real, where it was supported and supplemented by a clear insight as to what is necessary, so that prayer was a, really a dedication of the individual to do what he knows is right, then you have a great power in prayer. But if we use prayer to try to find out 
what we should appreciate and what we should not appreciate, it is very doubtful if we can get enough clear directive to solve very much. What we have to do is to mature this emotional life. We have to enrich it, and we have to occupy it. Um, a man's emotional life is not well employed at our time. His hands may be busy, his head may be loaded, but his emotions sort of drift along on the level of trial and error. Very few persons are well employed, usefully and gainfully dedicated on the emotional level. Emotion becomes escape, outlet. It becomes uh, indignation, anger. It impels us to all kinds of violent resistances to the patterns of life. But emotion does not normally play a sufficiently powerful and constructive role in our living. There are exceptions to this and where we find people who have fair integration, emotion does begin uh, to have a very therapeutic effect. Young women particularly, emotionalizing on the problem of family, find tremendous emotional outlet in mother love for children. And a woman who finds this and finds a great emotional dedication is not only now emotionally enriched, but by this very dedication is enriching the children. But we don't find enough of this. We find too many people who do not have any real and deep emotional feeling, who simply gradually develop a kind of self-pity because raising children interferes with freedom of personal action. Under such condition, there is no emotional bestowal or transference that has any integrity. We find also strong emotional pressures in a conscientious man who is supporting his family. He is certainly supporting this family only because of affection, regard, or perhaps sometimes a negative emotion such as pride. But for the most part, it is sincere and gives a strength to what would otherwise be a routine and monotonous existence. It gives meaning. And this is another point which we have to realize in connection with emotion. Emotion can give meaning. It can take a situation and transmute it as though by magic. For well, the magic of meaning, by which the individual suddenly realizes that he is doing something that is terribly satisfying to his soul, this uh, takes mo most of the labor and monotony out of physical existence. It gives color. It gives light. So emotions can give light and color. They can give directives. They can gradually support the person in the sacrifices that he must make in order to live a well-adjusted life socially. We must then try to provide emotion with the outlets that are suitable to it. In the last 20 years, we've been losing ground in our cultural level very, very markedly. Nearly everyone who is at all thoughtful is disturbed by this. And by being disturbed, we mean that his mind has set up anxieties which have awakened his emotions. For this disturbance, this apprehension, is the very small, tired voice of an outraged emotional nature. The emotions themselves uh, can be led astray, but under normal conditions they want to move in the right direction. So in our way of living today, we are bombarding the individual and the whole structure of society with a very decadent emotional pattern a pattern that is not productive of anything that is useful. 
out of the whole general drift, which is brought home to us every day in our newspapers and the television reports and radio announcements of the anxieties of groups that are dedicated to essential learning in these areas. Every day we are emotionally disturbed by a kind of apprehension, a feeling that this lack of emotional integration is going to gradually lead us to some major disaster. And this anxiety, supported by the constant evidence of the lowering of our levels of emotional in uh, integrity, the, this is beginning to be a serious problem in human life. Individuals are taking it on more than ever before. And it is resulting not in a solution, unfortunately, but a great emotional depression. Now, emotions can be depressed and just as much as industries can be depressed. We all went through a financial depression in 1929. Today we are facing a great emotional depression. And we are beginning to realize that just as we were unable to face the depression of 29 with a good spirit or with a high standard of conviction, we are not able to face the present emotional depression uh, with adequate resources. We are learning that the only way we were emotionally sustained at all was by the common level of things. We held each other up. And as those around us begin to fall, we find no strength in ourselves to stand on our own feet. So the emotional need of the person today is very real. It is not just an hypothesis of some nature. It is not just something that would be nice if we could get around to it. Today, our emotional attitudes are interfering with the clarity of our thinking. They are disturbing all our relationships, personal and collective. They are undermining the relations of nations and states and groups and classes. They are digging into what might be considered as the residual honesty left in our industries and in our systems of life, political, cultural, scientific. Everywhere that we turn, we see individuals who are not what they should be because their emotional integrities are not clear. Well, it's bad enough to find them all around, but it's a little more embarrassing still to find this condition in ourselves. And having found it, we begin to do what we have always done, look for someone to blame for it. Well, in the moment, there are marvelous opportunities to shift responsibility. We can find what appears to be hundreds of good reasons why we should be tired, unhappy, disturbed, miserable, frightened, and not only uncomfortable, but unpleasant. There, there are excellent causes. There seems to be nothing lacking for an adequate excuse in all these areas. Well, the excuses perhaps give us a certain amount of self-satisfaction, but they do not solve anything. We can excuse our faults forever and still die of them. We can say how disturbed we are by the fact that our neighbors are falling apart, but uh, we are still confronted with the problem of whether we are falling apart or not. And most people show a certain distinct deterioration. Uh, they are more critical than they ever were before. It is easier to excite them into some kind of mob action or violence than ever before. And while many persons, of course, will never participate in any uh, mob violence, they will unite with others of their kind psychologically in the defense of political programs that are destructive to the common good they will also find less time, less energy, less interest in being kindly, good-natured, patient people themselves. 
more individuals who are having trouble with their neighbors than ever before in history. And yet, by actual fact, 90% of those who are having the trouble do not even know their neighbor's name. They can't stand anything anymore. Children playing, terrible, destroy us utterly. Uh, cars coming in and out of driveways, oh, horrible. A few years ago, we were interested in things ourselves. And when our own interests are real, some way we don't notice what other people do in the form of minor inconveniences. But when we have no activity or interest in our own affairs, we simply wait and listen for bad news, and it always comes from somewhere. We used to be able to read a newspaper with its various unhappy announcements and be only reasonably anxious. In fact, we even sometimes took little resolutions from these problems and said, well, at least I will never make a mistake like that. Today, we have nothing of this nature except more depression, more beating down, more conviction arising within us that everything is wrong, more fear, uh, almost terror of things uh, to come, and from uh, directions in which we never expected it before. Terror now coming from the levels of science. According to some recent reports, the men, about 70 of them, who were first involved in the development of nuclear fission and the development of the atomic bomb and later the whole theory, most of these men are now in a very unfortunate, disturbed emotional condition. If, uh, immediately after the development of nuclear fission, these men were regarded as the great scientific leaders of the world. And then popular opinion turned on them. And gradually, the world began to think of these people as great destroyers. And the scientists themselves took it on. Now they are developing the most frightful inferiority complexes. They are developing self-censure. And as is usual in matters of this kind, each one is pointing his finger to someone else as the larger villain. But they are all disturbed. And from them are coming all kinds of strange messages arising from disturbed mental and emotional thought and level. So everywhere there is disturbance. Uh, world leadership slipping around from one part of the earth to another and no one knowing where anyone stands, all this type of thing produces emotional stress, emotional pain, emotional insecurity. And the person seems to feel that he has every reason why he should go on to be a brilliant success like the famous uh, opera story uh, while he is dying of a broken heart. Uh, we have the, uh, the same Pagliacci situation. The world having a big time, uh, more extravagant, uh, more hilarious than ever before, with the whole thing merely a nervous tension. No one really happy about much of anything. This type of condition coming home to the person is a clear revelation that he has no faculties or powers within himself to control feelings or direct them. And unless he develops these faculties, no amount of thinking will get him out of his troubles because his thoughts will gradually lose vitality and emotional discouragement can completely paralyze mental processes. The individual hates himself, who is disillusioned in himself, who is despairing of all other things in life, will not be a clear thinker. The use of emotion to meet some of these problems is nature's answer. It is the way things were intended to be. 
But we call on these emotions for support and suddenly realize that our way of life for many hundreds of years has been against the development of a strong personal nature. We have become more and more dependent upon the world for moral support. We hope that idealism, integrity, uh, optimism, creativity, faith, hope, and charity will come to us as part of the great society. But we are doing nothing to create it. And if we think for a moment that mere protection of the physical needs of man will bestow upon man cultural insight, if we think this, we're wrong. For all that uh, giving man more material advantages uh, can do is to preserve the comfort of the body. It will not assure the individual will make any effort to improve his own nature. In fact, it is likely to slow down self-improvement rather than to increase it. For the reason that the individual who can be comfortable without being better will not try to be better. That's obvious. The only thing that has saved us in the past is our discomfort. If we lose that, there is nothing left. To meet the emergency, the person has to come around and begin to do his own thinking. In philosophy, in religion, in psychology, in all creative fields of life, we are induced in every way possible to enrich the total inner life of the person. We are taught again and again that the final security of man is the victory of an enlightened internal over external circumstances. Without this victory, we cannot be sure of developing any kind of an enduring culture. Now, you peop the people working on these problems come again and again, but they do not seem to have any real answers. And you try to explain these problems, and the individual hardly understands what you're talking about. It is The field has been so grossly neglected that even meanings, even the ordinary communications that you would expect to be possible between two reasonable adults, such, such communications are impossible. There is just nothing now to work with except for the most part a person who is emotionally uncomfortable and wants someone to correct the situation for him. This is about all you have to work with. It's like trying to rationalize with a child that's bumped its thumb. There's nothing to build upon. The adult wants someone to do what the parent does, kiss the thumb and make it well. There is no intention uh, to do anything to make these processes operate within our own lives. Now, you can start by a few little basic thoughts on these matters. How do you feel nowadays when you get up in the morning? Does the world look hopeful or hopeless? Are you already locked when you awaken with some pattern of grievances? Have you made very strong allegiances to attitudes and are now in the condition in which the day is good or bad according to how these allegiances go? Have you decided on some candidate for some office and the whole life from now on depends on whether he gets into office or not? If he is defeated, the universe has come to an end. Have you brought forward out of yesterday a large pattern of unsolved grievances? Do you wake up remem remembering that you are neglected and forgotten and forlorn? Do you wake up with a horrible realization that you are not understood? Do you open your eyes each morning into a world that you know to be inhabited by utterly selfish, self-centered people who are taking it out on you? 
Are you waking up in the morning to keep on the old feud that your relatives are out to get you? <laughs> Do you, when you start out with the day, look forward with absolute certainty to things being worse before night? Do you try to get out of the situation by simply not caring? Or after a few hours of it, do you turn on an absolutely impossible television performance to get it off your mind? As a result of that, getting something else on your mind that undermines what faith you have left in anything. <laughs> Are you one of these people who still believes in a kind of a frantic manner that if you had a few more dollars, something would be solved? Or if you had a few less dollars, something would be much worse. <laughs> what are the basic attitudes that you get up with? Do you get up with any strong emotional allegiances to what is good? Do you get up with a firm conviction in your soul that God is in his universe? Or have you come to the suspicion that he departed from it long ago? <laughs> Do you get up with any feeling in yourself that the day is an opportunity to achieve anything or that it is merely a period of time in which you must somehow continue to avoid difficulties? Is the day a success because nothing has fallen on you that day, <laughs> which makes it more probable that something will fall tomorrow? <laughs> If this is the way you start out, it means that as far as your life is concerned, your emotions are worthless. In fact, they're worse than that. <laughs> they are contributing inevitably to your total bankruptcy. Do you try to make a busy time for yourselves by worrying about everybody else? Do you find a certain emotional satisfaction in being able to observe how bad things are in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indochina? Does worry about this sort of fill up your emotional vacuum? When you relax emotionally, do you grab on some bad news and dramatize it? Or when you begin to feel a little bit sorry for conditions in Vietnam, does it remind you of how much worse off you are? <laughs> Even though you are sitting in a very comfortable environment and those poor people out there are sweating it out to death in a temperature of 140 degrees. But to the average person, such suffering as that is nothing in comparison to the fact that they're not getting what they want right now. This is emotional infancy. This is the type of thing that will gradually undermine and tear down the mental superstructure that has been built over it. It is the termite that is going to eat out the foundations of living. For without some form of emotional integration, nothing else is ever going to work out. No one can live well on a program of unfolding fears. No one can get anywhere on a program of continually trying to self-justify condemnation and criticism of others. These things show complete lack of emotional discipline. And the person just simply awakens in middle life to the realization that he has no facility to even train his emotions. He doesn't believe that it is possible for him to change them. It's amazing. We are taught and we finally learn that we can change our minds. But we are not so easily convinced that we can change our feelings. The one reason why perhaps we can change our minds is because every so often our own thinking comes head on into collision with a fact. And this fact is so factual we can't do anything about it. <laughs> By the time it has been thoroughly documented and we either actually see the situation with our own eyes or a reasonable photograph thereof. 
when we discover that everyone else with common sense has come to the same conclusion, uh, that there is proof beyond question that our attitude was not the correct one, then we usually have to change, not because we want to, but because we cannot be in such a helpless minority. We can't show our heads to our friends when we're so far from the facts. But in emotion, there are no such obvious realities to guide us. It is very hard to prove conclusively that our emotions are wrong. We can know that they are wrong. We can learn from experience that we are suffering from them because they are wrong. But there is always evasion. We can't photograph this situation. We can't get evidence of it in a laboratory. We cannot send out a spaceship to prove this or that. Emotions are something that are highly individual, and we try to solve them with their own agencies. We use feelings in an effort to understand or correct feelings. We have, we have no clear, uh, detached agency that can sit down quietly and show us our own emotional failings. We can try a counselor, but unfortunately he will not know us as well as we know ourselves. He cannot probe into us to the degree that we can examine our own lives. If this emotional situation is not profitable, it is hurtful. If the day for you is not as good as it should be, because of emotion, you need no other proof. The situation requires immediate consideration. The only consideration that we can really bestow upon it, in most instances, is some kind of emotional exhilaration. We have to give the emotions an experience of great happiness. We also have to discover gradually what emotions are endurable and how can we use them. Very often in the days of European life, and Europe had a very hard time for hundreds of years, the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, the Seven Years' War, Europe was in trouble all through its history. But when the common citizen, the little man, got to the point where things closed in upon him pretty heavily. He found in the midst of his society the great cathedral. He found a living symbol of his faith. Now what this faith was is not important. What it did to him is the important thing. He went into this great structure which incorporated all the beauty of creative artistry in a hundred fields. A sublime thing standing in the midst of his own insecurities. His own little house was not very beautiful. His own little village was tired and war-stricken and plague-swept. But this great symbol, this symbol with its rose glass windows, its great arches, its beautiful paintings, its wonderful designs and symmetries. This was something that symbolized the love of God for man, the presence of the Spirit. And in the sublimity of this atmosphere, the person felt the presence of God. Perhaps he didn't feel this as the presence of a personal deity, but he entered into a situation in which he had the experience of a great positiveness with which to meet the small negatives around him in life. The great cathedral was more important than the village and its strife and its discord. It had stood through many wars and probably would stand through others. It was there with the rise and fall of many despots. 
He wasn't critical enough as a person to examine too much about the psychology of the problem. He did not settle down to emotionalizing the sublimity out of the cathedral. He simply accepted it. And he accepted it with the final experience that the world of the spirit was stronger and greater and more wonderful and more beautiful than the world of the body. And he went back to the ordinary things comforted. It is as though he had received something of this water of everlastingness. And having been thirsty for beauty, thirsty for quietude, for peace, for sublimity, he went into the presence of the symbol of the power of deity, the most beautiful symbol that man could conceive, a symbol that had taken centuries to perfect, hundreds of years of building, generation after generation of artisans had labored upon it. It was the great symbol of greatness in the midst of a small world with many conflicting symbols of smallness. This was his emotional medicine. This was beauty moving in upon his own consciousness. And this beauty was so powerful psychologically that it did sustain him. It enabled him to bear many misfortunes and to suffer many injustices with a great peace of soul. And later, surrounded by his children and perhaps their children, he gave them the final benediction of his faith before he departed from this life. He lived within a faith in which his emotional inner nature was strong, even though his physical outer nature was hopelessly underprivileged. Now, we cannot completely recapture all of this because our way of life is different. Today, the great factory and the apartment house and the industrial empire rises high above the spires of the cathedrals. Today we live a different kind of life. We have placed our securities not upon faith, but upon the material commodities of existence. Yet each of us still has this need. And the only way that we can really solve it now is by gradually building into both the mental and emotional lives uh, the great beauties of truth and principle through the quiet studies of constructive systems of thought, through gradually knowing the great religious teachings of the world, the great arts, the great philosophies, the great ethics, becoming more aware of the noble examples of man's humanity surviving the silence and sorrow of man's inhumanity. But today we do have what you might term the great cultural structure. We have betrayed it in many ways, but it still stands as the inevitable hope of our way of life. We can reach out emotionally and mentally also at any moment to embrace the great values of life. If we have been students of philosophy, we can embrace the laws of living. We can see the great principles of rebirth and cause and effect and harmony and rhythm and evolution and these great processes going on in life around us. If we have something of this psychology within us, we can look into the night sky and see the tremendous expanse of existence of which we are a part. And by interpreting these things in terms of a conviction, we can emotionalize a hope in the place of a fear. We can see more and more in people around us the struggle for realities and becoming a little less critical and a little more understanding, we can reach out with better emotional attitudes toward other people. We can also gradually take hold of the great commandments of life which have come down to us as being the only things that actually operate. Today we would like to deny them, 
We say they won't operate. But we haven't proven that they won't. We have not tried sufficiently to find out whether they will or not. But they interfere with our personal feelings and selfishness at the moment, so we declare them to be failures. But let us reach out with them into some of the areas in which good might be accomplished. Let us begin to sense the dignities of patience and forbearance. Let us really try to know the meaning of returning good for evil because of its effect upon our own psychic integration. When we return evil for evil, we hurt ourselves. We add to this psychic sickness. We add something else to the negation of our feelings. And the less we use our emotions well, the more troubled we become in every area of life, mental, emotional, and physical. So we have to train our emotions some way. And the two great systems that have been particularly developed for that purpose and have been united in that service for ages are religion and art. These have been the two fields, art glorifying religion, religion inspiring art. All of the beauties of the world have come from the inspirations of faith. And man's living faith within himself has wrought all the essential progress that man knows. Underneath the surface of these numerous modern ways of doing things, which eliminate these principles, the old facts themselves still stand. It is the beauty in man that creates progress. And when progress is true and is inspired by beauty and integrity, this progress in turn strengthens faith and enlarges our capacities for happiness and security. We have to come back now to doing these things for ourselves. In order to do these things for ourselves, we have to turn to resources within ourselves. Can we turn today into ourselves as into a beautiful night sky and see stars shining everywhere? Or do we see only a cloud-ridden sky? As we look into ourselves, have we enriched our own psychic nature with the evidences of beauty? Have we really tried sincerely to build into ourselves all kinds of noble thinking and experiencing. Do we have a rich life in art or music or great literature? Uh, do we appreciate the good things that have been done? Do we have a quiet veneration for the great teachers who have done so much for us? In picking up a newspaper, do we ever notice really and build in constructively those little fragments that come occasionally of someone who does something that is magnificent in this world. Someone who does sacrifice self for the good of others. The father who drowns trying to save his child. The man who goes out into the jungle and dies of the very fevers he goes to treat. Those who struggle and strive for good. Are we keenly mindful of them? Or do we spend all our attention on the bad news? If we can look inside and find there the quiet workings of a growing faith, then our emotional lives will be healthy. If we can look inside of ourselves and always find there a world a little better than the one around us in this world, the fact that the better one is inside is going to finally result in a better world on the outside. Civilization only fails when the world inside of the individual loses value. If you are watching yourself and you find that values are slipping away, make a little program of some kind to restore value. Make a conscious effort 
to find good, to see how things that are desperate and difficult can attain good. Look back over your own life and see how many times the so-called misfortunes finally led to a greater security than you had ever previously known. Do not be Pollyannerish. Do not try to manufacture something good that isn't there. Do not go out and deny empirically that there is anything wrong in the world. This is only self-hypnosis. Try to feel the facts that life, like the life in your own child, is a struggle that the adolescent child is trying desperately to adjust and organize and integrate against pressures that are very difficult, pressures that seem at a given moment to be supreme. There is no way of overwhelming them. And the world around us is this same thing. People trying to adjust themselves to the challenge of their own internal lives. And this same pressure that today seems so violent and terrible can become the basis of the great beauties that carry the world. If it had not been for sublime conviction supported by enlightened emotion, we would never have had great teachers, great artists, great creative thinkers, individuals who cheerfully died, perhaps of starvation, in order to bestow beauty upon their world. These are the same emotions grown up that cause the growing child to have great adjustment uh, crises along the way. We all have to use this emotional content to build with. And unless emotion is strengthening us, unless in our emotions we feel better, then we simply have to re-educate this emotional structure. And we have to re-educate it by pointing out to it, day after day, that its negative attitudes are not real. The mind, then, can help us to educate the emotions, not by forcing a mental conclusion upon them, but by revealing to the emotion that its own attitudes are not mature, that it is overlooking something, that it is failing to consider the whole story. Also, that emotions uh, properly developed are an absolute necessity to us. The mind cannot govern without the heart. And when the mind tries to govern without proper emotional maturity, then the life falls into another dilemma. The mind and the heart have to work together. And if they do work together, and the mind becomes a little critical and a little disillusioned, the heart moves in with faith. And if the emotions of the heart become fanatical or excessive, the mind moves in with prudence. And these two working together can give the person a pretty good life. But if one of them, especially the emotional, is not matured, not developed, not integrated, the whole life is weakened. The reasons for life, the purposes of effort, uh, the goals to be achieved, the incentives to accomplish, all require the warm, bright light of constructive emotion. And when the emotion gives up, when the emotion goes sour or goes bad, or the emotion is disturbed or discouraged, then the whole career is threatened. Little by little, under those conditions, wrong attitudes take over and the person is the victim of his own negations. So use emotion to build character, to build consciousness, to stimulate the resolution to achieve good. Use emotion to warm the mind into making selections that will help to enrich the life. Never let the monotonies and mediocrities of thinking uh, survive without the warmth and radiance and glow 
of emotional interpretation and insight. Build these two together, and together they can build you into a much better life and a much fuller experience than you have ever had before. Well, time is up. That does it.